Hello, and welcome to GAPNA Chat, an official podcast of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. GAPNA Chat provides interviews and discussions with GAPNA leaders and members of the gerontological healthcare community, and will focus on advocacy, policy, education, professional development, research, and clinical care for older adults. Before we get started, a practical guide for the gerontological specialist is now available for purchase in the GAPNA store. This text is a handy resource for anyone caring for older adults and is helpful to those preparing to sit for the gerontological specialist certified exam. Visit www.gapna.org to get your copy. In this episode, Dr. Cassandra Von S., a gerontological nurse practitioner and member of the GAPNA communication team, talks with Congresswoman Jen Kiggins, the U.S. Representative for Virginia's 2nd Congressional District and a geriatric nurse practitioner. We are pleased to present Dr. Von S.'s interview with Congresswoman Kiggins. Well, today, this is Dr. Cassandra Von S., and I am chatting with Congresswoman Jen Kiggins. She's proudly serving Virginia's second congressional district in the U.S. House of Representatives. And that includes Virginia Beach, the Southern Shore, part of the Chesapeake, Southampton, Isle of Wight, Suffolk, and Franklin City. The Congresswoman was winged as a naval aviator in 1995, and she served our nation for a total of 10 years as a helicopter pilot flying H-46 and H-3 helicopters, completing two deployments to the Persian Gulf. After serving in the U.S. Navy, the Congresswoman used her GI Bill benefits to go back to school and become a board-certified adult geriatric primary care nurse practitioner. As a graduate of Old Dominion, University's nursing school, and then Vanderbilt University nurse practitioner program, she has worked in several long-term care and nursing facilities in Virginia Beach and Norfolk, in addition to serving as a primary care provider for a private practice in Virginia Beach. After years of growing frustration listening to politicians, the Congresswoman took her experience directly to Richmond. She served three sessions in the Virginia State Senate, where she successfully championed legislation to establish a military spouse liaison and advocated for patients, families, and caregivers in long-term care facilities. She comes to Congress determined to bring civility and competence to politics, something that she believes and all of us, believes, is severely lacking in all levels of government. Thank you, Congresswoman, for your service and for making time to chat with us today. Oh, gosh. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be with you guys. Firstly, um, let me ask you, considering your journey from Navy pilot to geriatric nurse practitioner, to then representing District 2 in Virginia in Congress, what would you tell an 18-year-old Jen about her future career trajectory? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I would I would probably tell myself to, to rest up because life is going to get very busy <laughs> as we get older. So, But, uh, you know, I, I, I think of the reasons why I I chose the different career paths, and uh, and it's certainly been an honor to, to serve in all the capacities. But serving our, our great country, my dad was a was an army veteran who served in Vietnam, and I just he was an army reservist when I was young, so I think that was really influential in my decision to to join the military. And then uh, I, I was a stay at home mom for a few years with my four children, which was an important job. But then when I decided to go back to nursing and, and to become a geriatric adult geriatric nurse practitioner, you know, my mom is a nurse. She's a diabetes educator. I have a brother who is a nurse at a VA hospital. So we, we have some, some healthcare history there, but I also had grandparents who were just really impactful in my life that I loved very much. One set My grandfather had Alzheimer's disease, lived in a nursing home, and I remember visiting, and that was back in the day when they used to tie patients to chairs, and I remember how it smelled, and it wasn't wasn't a great 
living situation. I had another grand set of grandparents who lived in New York City and they were very independent. They did a lot of traveling. They drove, they they just had a great quality of life as they got older. So so I would I would visit both sets of grandparents and really just uh just watching the differences in how they aged. And I would always think that we, you know, what else can I do to help my my one grandfather who who had the cognitive impairment and and lived in the care setting. So so it was it became uh, just kind of a, a passion project and how can I serve our greatest generation? And so it was a real privilege to you know use my GI Bill and then go back to school at ODU and Vanderbilt and uh, and to be able to practice just in all the all the different care settings, home health, hospice, primary care, memory care, nursing homes. It it really uh, taught me a lot a lot about empathy and understanding and working with families. Uh, you know, and patients, and and I use use those the things I learned in those care settings every day in politics, and it really helps to shape who I am as a as a politician. So I guess I would you know just tell myself take good notes because all the things that that I learned from the discipline from the military, the the lessons we all learned from raising children at home, and then uh, just the lessons that I learned uh, you know as a practicing nurse practitioner, I use all those things every day here in politics. And we, we need more of it. I'm the only nurse practitioner here in Congress. So uh, it's a big job. I feel like I have trying to, trying to hold down the fort for all nurse practitioners. And that leads us to our next question. When you, when I think about you being a naval helicopter pilot in combat in the Persian Gulf and how prepared that has made you for the possible harrowing confrontations (laughs) that, you know, you may encounter in Congress every day. How have you been able to communicate your passion and advocacy related to older adults to, you know, your non-medical peers? Because, you know, we sort of have our own language and it's it's easy to talk to other nurse practitioners and other people in healthcare. I mean, certainly by being a voice for not just our greatest generation, but also for families and caregivers. Here in Congress, I am a co-chair of uh, primary care caucus. I'm co-chair of a nursing caucus. I'm also co-chair of a caregivers caucus. And then I invite myself to the doctors caucus even one, every once in a while, just to remind them that that we are we are on their team and in, uh, in the healthcare healthcare front. But uh, you know, I, I find those places uh, that I can use my voice. Uh, you know, sponsoring legislation uh, both on the state level when I had the privilege of serving in Richmond in the state legislature, and then. Uh, here in Congress as well. I remember in the, in the state house, I was on a healthcare commission. We did a lot of work with nursing home reform. We, I was there during COVID, so we we saw many challenges uh, during that time with long term care settings and uh, rehab and assisted living. And and we worked on some visitation policies, so codifying, uh, you know, that that facilities had to at least communicate what their visitation policies were to caregivers and to loved ones because we saw many of our older adults really suffering from isolation during that time and it was hard hard to watch in addition to taking you know into consideration what the health department regulations were and uh, and how we could be protective of that population but we did some legislation with clergy visits making sure that they were afforded that that opportunity either virtually or in a safe way in person but uh, so being able to work on some of the, those reforms, I worked on a, on staffing ratios for a little bit that that did not pass while I was there. But but I think it was a discussion to be had. It's a solution. There's there's a lot of different opinions about it, but um, but we needed to do better. Uh, and so this was something that I was able to at least use my voice. And then in here in Congress, there's a lot of work to be done. You know, just even with with Medicare, with how are, how are our greatest generation, our elderly, affording their prescriptions? How are we incentivizing caregivers and helping them through their journeys? So I find legislative ways that I can either co-sponsor a bill or speak to a bill, advocate for a bill, and, and educate my peers here that are not, that either are not healthcare or not maybe geriatrics, you know, focused. I think that we offer a different approach to problem solving and, and uh, just really prioritizing all the all the things that we think of first when we take care of the elderly, even different healthcare professionals don't think of those things first. So, so it's it's a different way to serve them. I miss the clinic side very much, but I I find just a lot of gratification in being able to use my voice in different caucus and legislative settings. You know, and you've really between your um, experiences with your grandparents and then working in long term care, you've really had a chance to you know, frame those conversations and, and your heart's not far 
not far from the patients, even though you're not in a direct care role. I want to say congratulations on your National Health Leadership Award by the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists for your advocacy on behalf of nurses in Congress. So we need, you know, you are, you are one voice um, in a lot, and we appreciate you amplifying our role. And I wanted to thank you personally for your efforts to bolster the ICANN Act. Um, I know we all at GAPNA were very involved in our health policy. Committee is very active and talking and writing and getting word, word out on social media. But after reviewing it, I just don't really understand why ordering nutrition services or diabetic shoes <laughs> appeared to be a threat to the American Medical Association. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, but I well, as good as mine. we were advocating, I think that was 2019 when I came uh, with the American Association of Nurse Practitioners for their legislative day for the first time visiting as a nurse practitioner, advocating to members of Congress about diabetic shoes. So I, I don't know why we're still talking about ordering diabetic shoes. <laughs> Seems like a no brainer. Uh, we continue to, to push that. It's There's a lot of leadership decides, you know, what comes to the floor for a vote, but we, we've got to get that done. We've been talking about it for too long and just yeah. allow, allowing all you know, nurse practitioners to be able to practice to the full extent of their, of, of their certification. It's just, it's frustrating that we still have to have these conversations. You know, between home health services and hospice services, you know, there is enough wellness and, and, and prevention that, you know, we can work together as a team. So they need to, you know, just relent a little bit. So I wanted to ask you about if you could speak to the components of the Improving Seniors Timely Access to Care Act that you had introduced, re yeah. you reintroduced it to, to Congress. And I know that your voice in Congress is sort of a journey. You know, everything doesn't always end in legislation, but it's like you said, you open a door, you start the conversation, and then maybe you know, the, the next session. But could you speak to um, that act that you um, reintroduced for us? Yeah, so this bill, it was passed unanimously by the House during the last Congress, so during the 117th Congress. And and so we brought it back for the 118th Congress that we're now in. And, you know, we know there's more than 28 million Americans that are enrolled in, in Medicare Advantage programs. So they know we know that the prior auth piece can be a challenge for them. And so what this bill does, Improving Seniors' Timely Access to Care Act, establishes electronic prior authorization process and some increased transparency, expand some beneficiary protections to just improve health outcomes. So, so it makes it easier to have that prior authorization approved. We don't need the hang up of, of waiting. I remember even with, with my own patients having to do it more than once sometimes. So, so it really just establishes an electronic prior authorization process for these Medicare Advantage plans. And it also includes the standardization for transitions and clinical attachments. So there's there's some other things that we have put in there to streamline this process, uh, because we want you know we want our seniors to obviously get timely care, and we know that just that prior auth process holds them up a lot of time. So that's what that bill specifically addresses. Was it taking um, particular funds out of the the resources, or was it just improving the the, the process flow? Because transitions are when our older adults are most vulnerable, those transitions in care. So that is very important. Right. And it wasn't a, a funding bill. It was a, it was a process bill. So making sure that we were uh, just able to, you know, have an elect electronic prior authorization process so that we could have these things and just being approved quicker so that we're not being handling everything via paper form sent through the mail, uh, which is what happens a lot of times. But I agree with you about just the transition process, and especially when our older adults are in and out of the hospital and we get them back in the clinic and we're trying to, uh, you know, not only do a lot of medication reconciliation, but then, you know, order order what they need or what they didn't get when they left the hospital. And so waiting for some of these approvals was taking too long. So that was kind of the impetus for this um, this particular act. It seems like even the physicians would be behind this one, so... <laughs> we would have, we would yeah. have <laughs> um, so are there some other ways that um, you're working to protect our Medicare population? 
Yeah. In addition to the I can act that we talked about, you know, briefly about removing some of those those barriers for uh, advanced practice nurses, which we need to continue to push for recognition uh, just nationally. And, and I know different states are doing some states are doing a better job than others. But there's some other legislation that I've been championing. Uh, the Expanding Telehealth Access Act is one that we we co-sponsored and that would increase just access to virtual health care and expand the types of medical professionals that can bill Medicare for telehealth services. And uh, that's something I know through COVID, we, when we started to really see the benefit of a lot of telehealth and, and phone consults too. I know with my older adult patients, it was sometimes hard to get them on Zoom and just that that kind of technology barrier. So, but making sure that that that's an option. A lot of times they they could do it with the help of family members and, but making sure that that's, that's an option for us to be able to bill for our time for either telehealth or for, for, uh, you know, phone consults. Uh, We also had a, there was a medical nutrition therapy act uh, that I introduced last year. That was a bipartisan bill and that would expand Medicare to cover medical nutrition plans. Uh, I know that was challenging, a lot of times they, you know, our older adults rely on nutrition supplements, either for their primary source of nutrition as a supplement, if they're, especially the frail elderly who are having appetite challenges, you know, we, we want them and we to, to have that. There's some great ones out there that medical, just nutrition supplements. And so they're expensive. A lot of times, I mean, we would, we would save samples in the clinic. I remember yeah. and just give them out to patients who were, who were really struggling, but we wanted to to make sure that Medicare was uh, was able to cover those those as well, and then we've we've done a lot of work with caregiving and supporting caregivers. That's been just kind of a passion project of mine. But I want to find ways to give families and, and loved ones just options for facility level care. I know that there's work we can do to try to make facility level care better. But how can we incentivize you know families and caregivers to perhaps take care of their loved ones at home. I think aging in place is something that I, I know that's a personal preference for me. I think it, if if that's something I was able to age in place, I think a lot of people really want to stay in their homes. And and these are the sandwich generation who are taking care of kids and, and their parents as well. So so how can we incentive, incentivize them to be able to do that when we know that they may have to work less and there's some expense involved, especially if you're hiring someone outside the home or uh, needing respite care or whatnot. So, so we had a credit for caregiver act, which I thought was a great idea. And it was a tax credit of up to $5,000 for 30% of the cost of long-term care expenses if you were paying more than $2,000 in a tax year. And that would be applied to families of caregivers for seniors or disabled children and adults. And uh, just finding again, like an, an incentive to incentivize them to, to care for their loved one in the home. We also uh, had a lowering cost for caregivers act that uh, allowed health savings accounts for an individual to be used for their parents or spouses if they're providing care for that. So uh, that's just a, another incentive because we know it's, again, sometimes expensive. We had a Home Care for Seniors Act that was a tax-exempt distribution from health health savings accounts to be used for qualified home care for seniors who want to age in place. Uh, so just, you know, finding those little ways to to help the caregiver and incentivize them monetarily. Uh, but uh, those are things that we're, I continue to push for. We, I have some great partners just with my colleagues and the caucuses I'm in and great outside care organizations too. And AARP has always been helpful. A lot of our nursing groups are helpful with just being advocates for this legislation. So so we'll keep pushing. Things happen real slowly here in Washington if, uh, if you haven't noticed so it's you know, sometimes it takes years to get these things across the finish line, like diabetic shoes, for example. Yeah. But uh, but we will. You just have to, to get it. <laughs> you just have to attach it to something that everybody wants. Yeah, if we you know, can attach yes. it to that, yeah, just you know, you know, right on their processes. right on their um, coattails. So, they like it, but yes, yeah. yes, that's a good yeah. idea. So when you think about your older adults and you know those in family those that, you know, you, you cared for as a nurse practitioner, what really keeps you up at night when you think about health care? Um, you know, we've talked about costs and the care partner needs, the support and maintaining independence. What really, you know, weighs on you the most? Just that people don't think of our older adults as a, as a really specialized subset of care and that they do require very specialized care and a different mindset. And it's not a group of people, I always tell my colleagues, it's not a group of people that come and, 
and advocate for themselves. They don't come to Washington, D.C. That, you know, they didn't come to Richmond when I was in the state in the state Senate. You know, their their family members even are often too busy to come and advocate. We get a lot of different groups that come and, and visit us and in the halls of government and advocate for their issue or, or their their professions or whatnot. But we we just don't get older adults, they don't come it's, and it's hard for them to communicate. They don't often write emails to me or, or call our office. So we need people that can appreciate and understand and speak for them. So that's why I really, I really applaud and uh, am thankful for healthcare staff like nurses and nurse practitioners, especially geriatric nurse practitioners who will come up and, and do a lot of this heavy lifting for me and to help me and to speak to all the members of Congress, there's 435 of us and our staffs and and just really educating them about the importance of specialized care for our older adults, what they need, what their families and caregivers need, how we can be helpful um, with you know nursing home reform, affordable medications, you know, taking care of their very specialized care. So we need more voices, you know, and if there's any nurse practitioners who are, uh, who are ready to run for office, you know, please let me know. I'm looking for friends. <laughs> so I'm here, but, uh, but I just appreciate the ones that can, even if you come and visit and use your voice and advocate for our, for our very special patients, um, that's always appreciated. So what's the next challenge coming up for um, Congresswoman Kickens? <laughs> What's yeah. next? The Senate? Oh, well, you know what? We've got November coming up. I'll say that. And, yeah, and so I think all of us are on the ballot this year for re-election. I'm just wrapping up my first term here in Washington. And it was a fight to get here for me. I, I represent, you know, Hampton Roads in Virginia, which is an interesting purple state just politically. So, uh, but I think you mentioned the reasons that I, I ran for office in the first place and kind of the lack of civility and incompetence and common sense. And, uh, and you know, I think a lot of us get uh, frustrated by what we see on the news. And I certainly hated yelling at the TV from my couch all the time. And so getting off my couch and, and wanting to participate and run for office, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, you know, I'm sure we've all seen different sides of political attack ads that are just, you know, ridiculous. And I can't, I can't change that part of politics, but, but being able to be here and to do the service job that I do, I do a lot of work with the military on the armed services committee on, I'm on the veteran affairs committee. I'm on a health subcommittee for the VA. So being able to do some healthcare work in that space, I sit on natural resources, which for my district, I live on Virginia beach and the Chesapeake Bay. So that's very important to my district. So so, you know, I, I wake up every day and I want to serve in those areas. So that keeps me very focused and the rest of crazy chaotic politics kind of exists around me that I certainly didn't run for office to be a part of that. I ran, I ran for office to be able to, to fix these things that I care about, which is, which is advocating for, again, our great military and, uh, and family issues as a mom, but then also healthcare issues specifically for our older adults. So so that is a, a true privilege. I never take it lightly. It's a fight to keep my job, but uh, but every day that I'm allowed to do it, I'm I'm certainly thankful. Well, your constituents are very fortunate that they have a strong voice advocating for their needs, you know, in in, in Washington. So I want to thank you again, you know, for your service to our country in many ways as a Navy wife and a Navy mom um, and a helicopter pilot and a congresswoman. And especially, you know, making time for us today in your in your busy life. And for all of you listening, until next time, as you take care of others, remember to take care of yourselves. Thank you, That's Congresswoman. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to, to all of our colleagues out there who are doing the tough jobs every day. I certainly appreciate uh, you all for the work you do to take care of our greatest generation. So thank you. Thank you. Gapna Chat is owned and produced by the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. All rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. If you are an advanced practice nurse caring for older adults and want to further your career, Gapna encourages you to sit for the Gerontological Specialist Certified Exam and earn your GSC credential. This expert certification distinguishes APRNs with the knowledge and experience to manage the complex health needs of older adults. Visit gerocert.org to learn more. Congresswoman Jen Keegans is the U.S. Representative for Virginia's 2nd Congressional District and a geriatric nurse practitioner. 
Dr. Cassandra Von Ess is the Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders Niche Coordinator, Geriatric Oncology at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. She is a member of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association Communication Team and is a host of the Gapna Chat podcast series. For archived episodes of Gapna Chat and to learn more about the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association, visit gapna.org. You can also subscribe to Gapna Chat everywhere podcasts are found. <laughs>